David Cage is a name you might immediately find you have a strong opinion about. Or maybe you have a strong opinion about his game company Quantic Dream. Games like Detroit Become Human, Beyond Two Souls, Heavy Rain, and Fahrenheit or Indigo Prophecy. Games that, if you have played them, you know are, well, they have a pretty specific vibe to them. They tend to kind of fall into their own category, more movie than game, with quick time events as the most important way to interact with the story. This is certainly not the most beloved way to play a game. And it's not surprising that most people know David Cage because of memes. Jason! 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 Is he here right now? Can you tell him to do something? And more memes. I'm afraid that's not possible. Your lady friend knows my little secret. He's just a memeable writer and director, it seems, and that is apparently not a controversial opinion. I have heard David Cage somewhat fondly referred to as a B game director, and critics have described his games as it's difficult to say whether we enjoyed it or not and complicated. There's a somewhat prevailing opinion that Cage made it in video games because video games want to be seen as legitimate art, legitimate cinematic art. And therefore, these kind of art house auteurs, such as Cage or Kojima, Druckmann, are tolerated in gaming where they never would have made it in Hollywood. And perhaps that's true, though I question exactly how high the bar really is in Hollywood. So Cage is known for producing sometimes laughably bad games that are fun enough and successful enough that they become something of a beloved bad game. And so he keeps producing works. If nothing else, David Cage's stories are memorable. The scenes and images he creates are striking and oftentimes have a sense of poignancy that may not be pulled off very expertly, but could have been. But this isn't a story about David Cage, not directly at least. Instead, this is a story about the game that started him off, the reason he even started working on games. Omicron, the Nomad Soul, or just Nomad Soul in a couple of territories, has a lot of the parts of his later works in it, but somehow less and more at the same time. His want to mix with celebrity to produce outstanding works of art, that comes through here. Technically, it was also marvelous, as for a game in 1999, it had pretty fantastic textures, good-looking characters, and it was even the very first time to ever have facial motion capture in real time. But of course, no one remembers Omicron for that. They remember it for... So here you are, the stranger in Omicron, conqueror of demons. Dagobah told me much about your exploits. You're not the first video game player to get your soul trapped in this dimension. David Bowie, the thin white Duke Ziggy Stardust, and Boz the digital internet activist. Yes, David Bowie was instrumentally involved in Omicron. Not only is he in the game, and pivotally as well as a major character, he also wrote an entire album's worth of original music for the game. Plus, 
over 30 instrumental songs for the background music. I can't play any of it for you because YouTube really doesn't like that whole copyrighted music thing, but you might have heard it for yourself at some point since he would release the entire album a few weeks before the game came out. Yes, his Hours album is in fact his Omicron album. However, these songs aren't just background. There are full concerts in game. You're just walking around and suddenly, boom, David Bowie concert. He helped design the characters he played as well, because yes, he is more than a single character in the game, playing not only Boz, the ineffable electrical agitator, but also plays the lead singer of The Dreamers, a band in the game that he also wrote a song about called The Dreamers on his Hours album. Music had certainly been involved in games before, and games had hired superstar musicians to make their music before. White Zombie did the Way of the Warrior for the 3DO. Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails did Quake's soundtrack and got included as artwork on the nail gun ammo. Michael Jackson did the Sonic the Hedgehog 3 music. It wasn't unheard of to have a musician involved in some minor way with your game, but this was a little different. Bowie was something of a futurist. He loved technology and believed in it very strongly. He saw a bright and shining future with technology, and he proved that by investing tens of millions of dollars into tech entrepreneurial enterprises. Bowie was the first major artist to allow his music to be purchased online. He streamed new songs onto his own private websites well before iTunes or Napster, and sold over 300,000 downloads of his newest single in an online only sale. He released interactive CDs that would allow his fans to splice together custom music videos. He was one of the first, if not the first, musicians to host a live streamed concert, calling it a Cybercast, in 1997 and broke the internet as it was at the time, completely maxing out the capacity. And in 1998, right around the time that he was negotiating to work on Omicron, he introduced his own ISP, literally a Bowie Net ISP that you could connect to the internet through. And right after Omicron, he would introduce his own online bank, Bowie Bank. To say he was digitally minded is an understatement. In fact, if anything, Bowie and his music are some of the first examples of the burgeoning transhumanist movement. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. It's just a tool, though, isn't it? No, it's not. No. No, it's an alien life form. What do you think, I mean, when you think then about the Is there life on Mars? <laughs> yes, it's just landed here. But yeah. that's, it's a simply a different delivery system there. You're arguing about something more profound. Oh yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the actual context and the state of content is going to be so different to anything that we can really envisage at the moment. Where the interplay between the user and the provider will be so in simpatico, it's going to it's going to crush our ideas of what m mediums are all about. Uh, but it's happening in every form. Mm. It's happening in visual art. The breakthroughs at the early part of the century with people like Duchamp, who were so prescient in what they were doing and putting down the idea that the piece of work is not finished until the audience come to it and add their own interpretation. And what the piece of art is about is the grey space in the middle. Thus, it was not actually particularly surprising that the futurist transhuman David Bowie would be drawn to a project about a transhumanistic future by David Cage. Omicron is still available and still playable 
and as of the most recent sale, was available for less than $2, and you may even already own it. On the announcement of David Bowie's death, Square Enix, the owners of publisher IDOS, gave the game away for free in memoriam. If you're at all interested, install it, try it out, because I'm about to spoil a few plot points, though I don't really think they're very important. Before I do that, however, let's talk a little bit about how this game came to be in the first place. Sometime in 1994, David Cage, a musician working on the soundtrack for the movie Time Cop, started writing a script for a video game. He sent this out to a couple game designers and they replied that it was technically impossible, couldn't be done. So as is often the case, he set out to prove everyone wrong. He took one of his sound booths and converted it into an office with a six month deadline to successfully pitch the game and get a budget. In that six months, he and five or six of his friends that he'd hired worked on the game, built an engine from the ground up, and created a working prototype. He created a motion capture system in his engine and additionally created a kind of puzzle logic system that they called the Intelligent Adventure Manager, a scripting tool that allowed for someone with no coding experience to still set up quests and success states so that a puzzle could have multiple avenues of completion. In something that Deus Ex would get all the credit for a year after Omicron, there were multiple ways to complete some objectives. Here's the most famous example of this in Omicron. You need access to the archives in the police station. You can choose to drug the police captain's coffee so that she falls asleep and you can steal her access card granting you access to the archives. Or you can bribe a mechanic with booze in order to steal the hardware necessary to hack into the police force's mechanized robots and then steal fuse from the drone operator in order to convince that operator to leave his post so that you can then hijack a police mech and engage in mech versus mech warfare in order to blast open the door, granting you access to the archives. Yes, it's still a David Cage game, and it's also an adventure game in the most traditional ways, as evidenced by that solution. And there are other problems with it as well. It suffers from atrocious controls. Tank-style movement similar to Resident Evil or Tomb Raider. Cameras that are a bit too swooshy and floaty to be helpful. And an inventory system and UI that is painful to deal with. Additionally, it's a game that is a bit muddled at parts. You might not be completely shocked to hear that there is combat in Omicron, but you might be shocked when I say they based it on Tekken. Yes, you'll be walking around and then suddenly, boom, time to get into a fight with fighting controls. High kick, low kick, crouch, block, punches, and more. It is a shallow but competent fighter, and it's just in the middle of this adventure game. Characters have stats that matter and weaknesses that you can learn and exploit. There's even a fighting tournament in the game that is not easy and if you win, you get a very sizable prize that changes the difficulty of the game pretty drastically. That would be one surprise, but how about the fact that there's also a first person shooter mode? Suddenly those pickups that are strewn around become actual pickups and you have to aim for the head and shoot quickly while managing ammo counts. It's abysmal. It's one of the worst shooters you could play, but it's here for some reason. It exists for some reason. It's in this game. I can't say how accurate it is. I couldn't find any original sources, but there's anecdotes that this mode was actually required by IDOS as a condition of publishing the game. There had to be a shooter mode, which sort of tells you where the game industry was at the time. However, this is the only real big change that seems to have come from Cage's original vision in his six-person sound booth office. See, during those months, Cage was shopping the game around and apparently had at least four major companies from EA to IDOS offering contracts for this game, more specifically for the technology in the engine behind the game. So Cage had enough influence to secure a pretty good deal with IDOS 
that only required him to add in this not great FPS section. Considering this is the worst part of the game by far, I think I might have to say that this is David Cage's best game, and it's actually pretty okay. I add in that part there because just being David Cage's best game doesn't necessarily mean a lot, but it's pretty okay. The story is one of adjunct transhumanism, somewhere in the mix of post-humanity and futurism with sprinkles of simulationism and digital immortalism and all sorts of other isms. There's a truly cyberpunk storyline with some dystopian authoritarian governments and rogue AIs and also demons and parallel dimensions. It's complicated. The core conceit is that you, yes, you the person, you the player, have willingly transferred your soul into this video game in order to help defeat a grand enemy. Some people in the game world are aware of this and talk to you, the player. This is further strengthened narratively by the ability to move in between bodies and temporarily inhabit them, and then use those bodies' strengths or skills to complete objectives. You could go in guns blazing, or you could take over the body of a guard and walk past everyone. That's the nomad soul part of the game, and it's why you are so important to this world. They know you think it's a video game, but it's their very real existence, and they live here. They survive here, they travel and have lives here, and you are there to save them or not. If you decide to, you can partner with Boz, the leader of the Awakened Cult, a group that sees beyond their world and recognizes you for who you are. Boz, of course, played by David Bowie. The other character he plays, the band The Dreamers, they're a real-world band in that universe as well. They are referred to frequently and considered to be subversives. You have to hunt down and find their concerts, which move to seedier and seedier locations as they are slowly outlawed. And their music is available in-game in a very real way. You can buy each song separately in a store and then play it on your apartment's transcan, or take it with you to play while rummaging through someone else's apartment. There are supermarkets and drugstores to visit and purchase from, and while an open world with a store doesn't sound that fantastical today, it was considered to be fairly revolutionary. For the first time, many gamers were given the experience of accidentally using a potion, needing another one, and just going to the store and buying another one. That is something people remembered. Seeing David Bowie in a live choreographed concert was memorable. Being sucked into a video game was memorable. Being in a living world and being a character there, all things that players kept in their heads. Omicron sold pretty well, and it's also one of the few games that has a lot of background for it. David Cage blogged about this game's process every single week from week one in his booth with his friends all the way through their contracts with IDOS until the game was released. He uploaded screenshots and concept art, videos that sadly don't exist anymore, music links that don't exist anymore, fonts, you name it. And as is expected, this was all saved, along with everything else, Winamp skins and cheats and patches, by fans. You can go through Cage's thoughts from week to week and understand his process in a way that I think makes this game even more enjoyable. And yes, more enjoyable. The game is enjoyable. In fact, of a lot of the retro older forgotten titles that I've covered, this one still plays well enough. Once you get past the clunky controls, which are remappable anyways, it's actually pretty enjoyable. And it's like 12 to 15 hours long, so on sale, that's like 10 cents an hour, which is pretty much the best value you can get. It's worth playing, for sure. Even if you already know David Cage, even if you already don't like 
David Cage. There has to have been something that made you pick up a David Cage game in the first place. Some glimmer you wanted, and I think it might be visible here. And it's got David Bowie, who made an entire album just to give this game some heart. I think the one thing that we uh, noticed immediately is that most of the material that's used in games is actually taken off albums. Um, very rarely is music actually produced for the game, but they've sort of taken a, an album track here and an album track there, um, and it, it sort of works some of the time. Um, but we were very, uh, we spent quite some time in Paris working with the team over there and understanding the depth and the many levels of the game involved. So we got a pretty fair idea of what the scenario was. We got to know some of the characters fairly intimately. The idea of writing songs specifically for a game is, uh, was really a compelling factor. And it's the one thing that we wanted to do. And we approached it as though we were doing a film. What we were trying to do more than anything else is provide an emotional heart to the game. As the one thing that I did find going through the games that I viewed before we started work is uh, a lot of the games have a cold emotional drive. If you'd like to know more about a game's history that's pretty interesting, here's a video to watch, and as always, I'll see you on the next one.